Hello, welcome to the big fight on what is going to be a rather unique, interesting topic. We, you have you heard of the concept polyamory? If you haven't, well, I hadn't heard of it either until fairly recently, and now apparently it's become one of those things that's being discussed and debated. And the entire concept around it is that humans were not designed to be in a relationship with just one person. You should be. And the fact that there are so many people practicing infidelity or being unfaithful is because you're forcing humans to do something which is unnatural, which is to be in a relationship with just one person. And therefore, instead of being in a monogamous relationship, you should consider something completely different. But we're going to be joined on this program by some of the people who feel that this is really the way to go, including somebody who described himself as a, polyam a polyamory activist uh, and who's a member of a group called the Bangalore Polycules, which actually puts it together. So Basit Manam is, is going to be with us. And there are others who are going to say, this is all crazy and what other loony stuff are, is this country going to come up with? So we have a range of experts who are going to tell us whether this is something that should be considered and uh, including psychiatrists who are going to tell us whether this is really the way humans think or, or do not think. So let me start by welcoming all my all, all our all our guests on this show. As I said, polyamory act, activist Basit Manham, it's great to have you with us, joining us uh, from Bangalore, who can take us through all aspects. Uh, Geeta Bhatt is a right-wing supporter, RSS supporter, who thinks that this is absolutely a crazy or a loony way to approach life in general. Um, Dr. Deepak Raheja is a psychiatrist I was mentioning, who's going to tell us which way humans are really uh, programmed. Adweta Kala, author of Almost Single. I'm trying to figure out whether this is almost single or not. I guess maybe it could be. You could could, be. If you're in a marriage with many people, is it being almost single or almost many? It's something for you to think about for your next book, Adweta. You get the idea. Remember where you got it from <laughs> first. We will discuss the sharing of the royalties Done. once this program is over. Nasir Abdullah, great to have, have you with us. Well-known actor it's, uh, you know, joining us from, from Mumbai with his perspective. Rahul Ishwar. Uh, social activist joining us from Trivandrum. Thanks for being with us. And Murnalini Deshmukh, who's one of the country's best known divorce lawyers. Uh, and I, I'd love to get her sense of whether there would be more divorces or fewer divorces if uh, polyamory is actually to be practiced. But Basit, why don't I start off with you? Singer, this is a concept that you are an activist for. Um, why don't you tell us what, what's behind this entire concept? Um, I started exploring polyamory about four years back when I, um, when, I, when I wasn't feeling very comfortable in the relationship that I was at that time. Um, um, there was nothing that was going wrong with this relationship that I was having. Um, however, it, just, it felt very natural for me to, um, uh, to easily imagine that I could fall in love with someone else. Um, when I was, um, and then I started reading more about open relationships, and that was when I struck uh, upon the term polyamory, and it seemed uh, to best describe what I felt uh, about relationships. Um, um, the I one of the can I just press I, a pause uh, button? I, I basically, mean, basically, if I understand this correctly, uh -huh. it's not entirely unknown. Mm -hmm. it's, it's called on the various names, including playing around, you know, being unfaithful, all those things happen. You're basically saying be in love with three or four people at the same time. Is that what it basically means? Be intimate with more than one person at the same time. Um, be well, in love uh, with more than one person at the same time. It's not exactly the same as having sex with many people, which is what infidelity is essentially boils down to. But is that what you're saying? You can be in love with more than one person at the correct. same time. Correct. Uh, so, uh, Vikram, let's look at the definition of non-monogamy and polyamory, uh, the textbook definitions of it for a, uh, for a minute here. So uh, non-monogamy is a larger umbrella where um, any intimate relationship that involves more than one person falls under their bracket. Uh, however, polyamory is, um, is defined as the desire or practice uh, of um, having a romantic relationship with more than one partner. And, and the defining characteristic here is romantic attraction and relationship uh, over sex. Uh, while in non-monogamy, broadly, you could have uh, um, uh, sex as well playing into a romantic or any other form of intimate relationship. Um, however, um, uh, polyamory is also uh, mostly known as the ethical way of doing non-monogamy, because there is an emphasis on, uh, on, on being honest and openly communicating with all of your partners uh, about uh, um, your relationships uh, beyond them. Um, and and, and in, in certain situations, you also see that three or four people are in a relationship or a union together as well. More than two or three people could be in a union together. Okay, I can see both Geeta and, and Rahul champing at the bit to get in. And Geeta, what do you make of this? Uh, well, Vikram, uh, if, I, if we look at it culturally, 
uh, we see that uh, you know in our culture we have always been kind of advised to follow a righteous path you know, whether it is in terms of you know being sincere in our profession whether we have been you know loyal to our country or whether we are being you know faithful to our partner our life partner so as i understand what uh, has just been told by the guest uh, the you know being faithful to one partner right that is what being uh, monogamous is so that is something which is a foundational construct of our social structure and if we are trying to deviate from it or if some people they want to experiment over it you know for a few years but how long i mean when they so, actually so plan more, to settle down point in life is, his point if i understand the and uh, understand it correctly and basit come in and tell me his point is accept the fact that you may want to be with more than one partner so be ethical about it start off with the presumption saying look this is the way it is going to be i'm going to be in love with three or four people or two or three people or we can have more than one relationship so you are starting off with that rather than doing it surreptitiously i would also like to just add one more point which you so had so presumably the partner has to be okay with it yeah. also <laughs> right right see if any two two mature people whatever you know they try to uh, decide among themselves you know that is a call which they both have to take but we are talking of a you know a largest larger topic here that how the society takes it that that, that is what i understand that is being discussed over here so uh, as you just also mentioned you know that um, monogamy is being considered as something which is uh, uh, which is not natural to mankind so i just wanted to make no that's a, that's a that's a thesis i'm not saying yeah, that yeah, it is or whether yeah. it is yeah, that is a thesis, a thesis. It's a lot of people you which is yeah. i'm going to get deepak actually tell yeah. us what is so i i just want to make two points to it and then you know uh, deepak can take over it first is that there are many things which are natural in the world but we do not subscribe to them just one example for example there is a polio virus is it something it naturally occurs but uh, there are governments all over the world who are basically doing lot of campaigns to kill it so and everything that is natural anything that is natural so does not mean that it is not exactly right. the same no, as no. a polio okay, virus okay okay second example that i would <laughs> like to say is dangerous second, impact no. also but so see the point is that whether it is natural or unnatural for example ever since uh, you know civilization has been existing on the earth various civilization it has been very natural for the mankind you know to uh, you, uh, to you know come up and to take over whether it is territorial war has been something which came naturally but all over the world what are we propagating these days that okay. we are talking about peace, peace right Fine. we have a nobel peace prize for it a lot point. of people Even are mind over it is part of the baser instinct you know biologically for people to be in multiple relationships you think that's not necessarily what you should try and do there should be a societal conduct can i just get you first to weigh in on on let's establish what is what is quote unquote natural and unnatural uh, you know uh, <coughs> because if you look at if you look at the at the animal you know kingdom as an example of what humans are or are not you have both types I mean, there are various animals which are genetically biologically monogamous and they stick in that relationship you know through their lives and the others which are not the species perhaps that men are most closest to which would be chimpanzees i guess are are not monogamous but that's not to say that there are others which are or which are not go back to the freudian theory of the development of sexuality and if we talk about the oral stage primarily the anal stage and the phallic stage in the oral stage the erogenous zone is the mouth in the anal stage it is the discipline and control and that discipline and control is meant to teach the child to take away the libidinal edipal electra incestual impulses from within the realms of the household to the outside world and as one grows up this society after experimenting with so many forms of of sexuality and relationships thought that you know monogamy was probably the way forward so and it was going to work so societal concept is what you are saying absolutely i think i think it is it is if you just look at the sheer data of people including indians that visit sites like ashley madison and tinder today and and the percentage of people who are married and in relationship and who claim to be in stable relationship it would be shocking so essentially what we are saying is whether it is a moral issue whether what we are saying is that it is okay to be in a sad relationship and still claim to be monogamous or to be upright enough to to declare and say that this wasn't working and maybe so that's a different issue you should you leave a a relationship that you're not happy with perhaps you should you should that you know there's no reason to be stuck in an unhappy relationship and move on it still doesn't conclusively prove one way or the other whether poly, whether polyamory is a more natural way for for humans to be rahul ishwar i'm sure has a strong view on this rahul what's a natural way for humans to be um, Vikram ji i have seen many people who claim that they are polyamorous that they can love more than one or two or three people at the same point of time but i am yet to see a person who says 
you know, I am missing two or three people at the same point of time. It is the intensity and depth of the relationship that really matters. I doubt whether a person can say I miss you to three or four people at the same time and say that I am in divine love with all four of you. So the quality of relationship, what we call the spiritual love or the soulmate, these kind of connects are very important. I am not a Yash Chopra fan, neither am I too romantic to believe in this concept. But at the same point of time, the, all the evidence in the history of mankind suggests that there is an ultimate monogamous partner, and monogamous family is more credible institution for the survival of mankind. There is much more deeper level. Yes, there is sexual attraction to many people, which is very natural. There is still a deeper emotional connect to many people, but there is some kind of a core soulmate kind of a concept, which is central to every religion and every civilization around the world. That's the reason why we always say Ram and Sita. That's the reason why, in spite of having eight wives, we always say Radha and Krishna, not the any other wife. So you know, we believe according to our culture and all the constructs or all the upbringing and all the positive civilizational values that there is a positive person made for you. Yeah, we are it's, in it's that not that it. it's not that polyamorous relationships are entirely mm -hmm. unknown even in even in culture and mythology. I mean, take the Pandavas for example, where it's yeah, not exactly. very clear whom Draupadi was was more attached to. You know, out of the five uh, at that particular point. But but yeah, I get yes, your point. But ba Basit. Um, what Rahul seems to be yes. saying is that that level of emotional connect can only be with one person. Yeah, you may be, may be possible to have sex in more than one person, but that level of emotional connect can only be with one person. How would you respond to that? Uh, but before I come to that question, just I, I felt that there's, uh, there's three things that I wanted to uh, put a little bit more clarity on, and I'll just quickly summarize them. Uh, one is that how natural it is. Um, and, and I think that, is, that there is arguments on both sides, right? Um, um, a, a bit of it is natural that a lot of people crave or have at least a desire to look out beyond their relationships. And uh, they do that, they tend to do that with more than one person. Um, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, for a lot of people, it could be also about practice, right? It's not, like, it's not that, that we stick to all our basic instincts. Uh, we can also choose to cultivate habits that uh, you know, prevent us from to doing that. Uh, for example, having, uh, eating on a table with forks, uh, I mean, uh, spoons and forks is something that uh, is not inherent or natural to humans, but something that we have cultivated over time. And for a lot of m people, monogamy is some a practice that is cultivated over time or some, uh, in some way imposed by the society. Um, uh, the second thing that I wanted to... But uh, Basit, uh, can I just interrupt that, you for a minute? Um, Basit, just let me just interrupt you for a minute. The point yeah. Gita was making, and uh -huh. it's a valid point, is that in mm -hmm. society, as mm -hmm. you develop from being a hunter-gatherer running around in a tribe somewhere, as you develop society, there are certain conducts, there may be certain norms that society imposes on you, and that's not necessarily wrong. It may be the base instinct of humans, for example, to kill somebody. I don't like this person. Well, you know, I'm trying to pick a random person sitting behind me. I don't like this person. In another era, I might say, okay, I'm going to fight for that person, clobber that person on the head with a stick, you know, or whatever. That's the way and hunter-gatherers may have done. But over a period of time, that's not what society conditions us to do. So therefore, what your baser instinct that may be true. or your natural instinct may be, may sometimes get subsumed by what society is, has told you over these millennia and it becomes part of living as a social, in a social that construct. True. That is true. However, let's look at uh, one, uh, two things to look at here, right? Um, I think the history, like, uh, monogamy, the way that we know today, uh, is fairly quite recent, actually. Um, in a lot of uh, um, <coughs> different times uh, and different uh, places in the world, we have, uh, we've seen different forms of non-monogamy being practiced. Um, the second thing is that what you said about um, 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 uh, you know, um, uh, I, th I think the assumption that is being made is, uh, what if everyone decides to be polyamorous and, and, and by uh, unnecessary, um, uh, I, it, and it's not uh, uh, definitive that this follows, but uh, making the assumption that they will decide to not be married or they decide not to have children, and what happens to the society in that case. Um, uh, but I don't think that is the case, right? Um, um, monogamy. It uh, could be the case. The only reason why that's not the case, if your logic of what you're saying people, is correct, and that's uh, probably what follows. But Nasir, let me just get some others in now who haven't yet had a chance to speak. Nasir, let me get you in. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with what Basit is saying? It's like a lot of men, especially, are like actually a Sinbad the sailor. They go. They want to go on new adventures and things like that. So that is one of the reasons that they get into it. And uh, you know. I, I'm, I mean, I'm not against it, you know, if you have a reason, even if the reason appear like boredom, a lot of people go out of boredom, you know, they need another relationship 
to feel more alive because they are in a relationship that is apparently cold or is used up and it happens to all the marriages all over. So just to go back a little historically, of course we were, you know, uh, not uh, not monogamous when we started out. There was a pack leader, there was a hunter hunter gatherer stage that we went through through civilization and evolved from that. It was actually the Greco Romans who institutionalized monogamy because they felt, mm -hmm. and that was also from a male perspective. So to bring in a little gender here, it was not from the perspective of rights for women or anything of that sort of security, marital security, the rights it would bring women, but it was from the point of view that the pack leaders or the powerful men really ha claimed all the women and lower down the ranks, especially in the army where you know foot soldiers and people like that needed women and partners as well, it wasn't a fair or equitable distribution of women in society. And that's how monogamy came into being. So it wasn't some moral diktat that really brought it in. What made it moral was that the church adopted it as an institution, and then the yeah. church had military power, where it colonized, it moved around the world. Even in our cultural tradition, if you look at the Rig Ved, um, polygamy is mentioned. You know, it's not that it's an anathema. It was only in 1955 or uh, around that time when it was outlawed in India. So, you know, when you look at monogamy, you have to look at it not only from the prism of morality, because if you do that from the prism of morality, your argument will fail. You look at monogamy from the prism of family, of basic social structures that build society, that build a nation. And I think when you view it from that point of view is really when you can address monog monogamy in a much more realistic way. Okay, I think that's a really interesting perspective and a really interesting point of view. Okay, uh, Mridani, let me just get you in on this. From the point of view of family and divorce and other things, that's it said, you know, every... Do you think it would make life better or worse? And is it for... It does it lead to more marital stability or less marital stability if these concepts are actually explored? More and more marriages today are breaking because lack of monogamous marriages or at least lack of those monogamous marriages which have come out in the open. The reason for that is that today people are, uh, I mean the couples are very, very honest and frank with each other. And they could even go around and tell their spouse that I'm sorry, I'm just out of love. And then I need to be either in the relationship of marriage for the sake of security, comfort of others, or I need to be out of this marriage but I cannot not give up my other relationship or relationships as the case may be. Now when such a question comes up, suppose if this is what a question the husband says to the wife, then the question that the, that the wife has to do, in some of the cases which I have seen and which is very very sad in case of women, because there is a lot of security, because there is financial security, social security, a family institution which is there, at least a facade of which is there, they silently accept the, the, um, the husband's non, uh, not commitment to the marriage and having been in a, in a relationship. I have also seen cases where the husband says that I'm willing to provide you with all the financial securities, socially we can all go together, but don't ask me to give up on my girlfriend. And there are certain cases where the women either make a big ruckus about it and come to a lawyer seeking a divorce, or there are some cases where women just want to continue this because maybe the kids are young or maybe because they, they feel that there is no other option available to them. So it's very difficult for me to say that in a situation like this, does a person not being monogamous, does it affect the marital stability or it does not affect the marital stability? Because I feel these are very different experiences which I have come across and these experiences Rather, they teach me a lot and I learn a lot from them as to how a human mind works. So, Mirali, before I come to Gita, the flip side of that would be that, yes, so the, you are dealing with, with cases, or she is referring to cases, as I think was Nasser, there are cases where a person is going to breach monogamy anyway. And then Basil's point is that in that case, you might as well do it honestly rather than doing it in a surreptitious manner. Right. Would it be your argument to say, well, you should try and maintain monogamy, not either do it through admitting polyamory or by, by practicing infidelity in the first place? Uh, see, uh, we have been talking about uh, polyamorous here, but I think uh, the most of uh, what we have all seen something in society is polygamy. I mean, polyamorous is something, a, a new concept which we are discussing here. So, but socially, if we try to see, I think human beings by nature, they are caring. They are, of course, very possessive also about, uh, you know, their partners or about their family, generally speaking. 
uh, what uh, Mrinali ji just said, there, there are such cases there and they, there could be many aberrations like that in the society. But if you look overall, generally human <coughs> beings, they are, they are very caring and compassionate and to some extent uh, possessive also. And uh, they seldom ex, uh, express compassion, you know. It's not like you see a child playing and you smile and you feel happy in his or her happiness. But that may not be the case if you come to know that your life partner is sharing that kind of a feeling with someone else, right? So, uh, what I feel is that uh, as far as uh, the question of uh, physical intimacy is concerned, if it is there devoid of any emotional interaction, I mean, how long can it actually exist? And as far as, as Mrilani ji was uh, talking about some cases where, you know, uh, the, the woman in the family or, you know, she is holding this facade that, yes, everything is going on well. But now the question is that if, if any such relationship is existing in, within the marriage, can you be open about it in the family? And can you discuss about it in front of ch ch children? What would be the repercussion of that? Okay. Nasser, would you, <coughs> you heard what Mrilani he said, is that summing up a yes. way a lot of the relationships are actually functioning right now? <clears throat> Any, anybody can argue as to how many people are actually in happy, stable marriages. And, and she seems to be saying that a lot of them are, are, are a facade, essentially. Yeah, um, it seems to me that the divine law of the cosmos doesn't really care very much if the marriage lasts for long or not. They're interested in one thing, that is the procreation and the multiplication of the human race, etc. That is what, <coughs> and it seems in the rest of the marriage, how it seems to go forth, etc. They're only, in the cosmos, they're only half interested. So, you know, once the job is, is done for the multiplication and the marriage stays for as long as the child needs to be nurtured and then love takes a back seat, etc. In the, in the eyes of the cosmos as well. That is what I see it as. And I have seen young boys and girls sort of okay and very understanding about the need for their father and mother to split. I have met many of them. That didn't happen earlier. The children used to go to pieces. Now there is, there is seemingly an awareness that this is the way it happens, you know, love dies down, etc., etc., and you know, so, one of my parents or both of them need to have another relationship. So even they accept it. Okay, Rahul, uh, are we? You know, I'm, uh, it, it's it would also be interesting to see: is this really the way the majority of families are, or is it at the end of the day a minority? We shouldn't try and impose a construct. Uh, that I mean, there may be, they are, for every example you can take of an unhappy marriage where the husband and wife don't like each other, or they fall out of love with each other, and their kids are saying, yeah, then he might still be apart. I'm sure there are as many cases, if not more cases, where actually the couple is, you know, stays together for the rest of their lives and are, and are perfectly happy. And those children should consider themselves, you know, also lucky that, yeah, fine, we have the same parents and they love each other and they are with us, you know, that family sort of stays together. Vikramji, just one point. See, you know, I'm proud to be a right-leaning conservative activist. But at the same point of time, let me be very honest in telling this. A majority of Indian family is either having disengaged marriage or disinterested marriage. They are just sticking together for the sake of their family, social pride and name. This is the reality of Indian situation. We have done serious research in Kerala uh, regarding these divorces. And we have found that 700, uh, Kerala is the divorce capital of India with almost 700 percentage increase in family breakdowns in the past 10 years. The critical reason for this is that they lack some kind of a premarital education, marriage orientation before they begin. They do all the mistakes. They end up having hatred for each other. They end up having all the wrong things in the first seven years. And then they end up drifting, each, uh, drifting apart from each other till eternity. There is no love in the marriages. That's the reason why in Kerala, we found a staggering statistics that among 50 percentage, which is Hindu community of Kerala, 87 percentage of divorce happens in the 50 percent community. And the least was in Christian community where there is a proper premarital education, what they call a uh, marriage preparation course where there is a spiritual orientation, there is a psychological orientation, there is sex education. So these kind of things are very important. And, and, and unfortunately, our people, including my leaders, just go on giving bhashans about Bharatiya Sanskriti of family, but do nothing on ground, something like family education or you know, marriage education. So this is a process. For example, states like Colorado in the US has premarital education being compulsory made for marriages. So we need to think about such kind of things. See, many a times people grow apart, not because they lack love, not because uh, they have any polyamorous ideas, but they lack genuine mutual feelings in their relationship, both physical, mental and spiritual, if you can use. 
So this kind of growing apart can be stopped by having good pre-marital education or what in pop psychology called men are from Mars, women are from Venus. There are some gender differences. There are some brain differences. There are some emotional processing differences. Unless a male and female complement each other, they are going to contradict each other and stay together just to put up a mask of a happy family, which in reality is not existing in India to a large extent. So it is high okay, time we a... review this and have these kind of things. All right, hang on. That's, that's actually a rather strong comment to make. Brunanali, let me just get a reality yeah, check from you on that I before I come here? to everyone else. Hang on. The, the very concept that, okay, we need to start figuring out yes. something different is uh, premised on what Rahul was saying. Premised on what Rahul was saying that a large number or perhaps a majority of marriages are unhappy. Uh, is that the way you would? I mean, I'm sure, Brunanali, a lot of the people who come to you, by definition, it's a bit of a process that they're obviously they're coming to a divorce lawyer because they're not happy. What would be your sense? Are a majority of marriages happy or unhappy? Well, I am a wrong person to answer that question because obviously people are unhappy in their relationship. It doesn't mean that uh, they come to the lawyer only for divorces, but they want to know what are the issues that can be sorted out, whether I could suggest them any counseling, which is what I do as a matter of uh, you know, routine and procedure. If I find that there are no serious differences between the parties and it's in the heat of the moment of really very little incompatibility, which can be sort of, you know, we can work on it, then obviously I tell them that they should go to a psychologist or they should go to a marriage counselor and try and find out or a life coach and try and find out if they can really work on their relationship. Because what they need an advice today, I could probably, if it doesn't work out, give it to them after six months. But obviously the first option is to work to stabilize the relationship and make it work. Okay. But to be very honest to you, uh, I mean today uh, a lot of people that we know and they come, they are educated, they know that they have to explore counseling, so they have exhausted all these options of going to a psychologist, to a counselor or okay. family yeah. mediators, etc, etc. And even then, after they finished and exhausted all that, they come. Okay, Azweta, would you want to respond to that? So, A, the concept which I think Rahul was, was putting out also that look actually there is something going wrong in relationship, a lot of them are unhappy. Uh, would you agree with that particular point of view? And I'm, again, I want to bring it back to whether polyamory is really the, yeah, the, the solution, solution to some, for, for some of this. You could just be, you could be in a situation where at the end of the day you don't like making the compromises that are involved in any relationship, in which case whether you have one partner or four partners, it won't make a difference. You should sure. probably be almost single. So just a disclaimer, I'm single. So, you know, I'm sort of coming from a biased perspective. I, yeah. I, do think, I do think marriage is an institution. I think it's a social contract in many ways because once you get past the fluff and the romance and you get down to the hard facts of marriage, it's really about EMIs and raising families and children and all of those other things. And I'm sure there's a certain amount of boredom or, uh, or lethargy even that can set into a relationship and relationship counselors will attest to that. But that's another other completely separate aspect of this. I think when you speak of polyamorous relationships, they may sound very exciting on the face of it, but there is also the concept of hierarchies. You know, so it's a primary relationship. So which one is your primary relationship, which is a secondary relationship, which is then the tertiary relationship. So are you really moving away from the complexity of monogamy when it comes to relationships where you have a spouse, for example, or a partner, and that person is your primary relationship, and then you venture out. So are you telling me that in a polyamorous relationship, there will not be issues of betrayal, of jealousy, of envy? I mean, there may be a lot of relationship talk, but the moment you will automatically, it's human nature to start having hierarchies, having secondary, tertiary, primary, all of that happens, even in this situation. And that so, can add to its own so complexity. So I don't think it really gets you out of the complexity okay. of your human Before relationships. Before I come, Pasa, let me throw that to you. Are you really doing away with a lot of the complexity yes. is the point that Adveta is asking, because at the end of the day, even if you have, okay, I don't have one partner, and I have three partners, who's your primary partner, who's your secondary partner, who's your third tertiary partner? Are you sure that the primary partner will not be ha feel left happy out. or unhappy or left out if you're spending so many hours with a tertiary partner? You know, there are all those issues which come in. Unless you're saying you don't have to have the, all yeah, of them at true. the same time. Yeah, which is, which is monogamy. Which is serial which monogamy. Is, which, which is, is serial, serial monogamy, monogamy then. Yeah. yeah. That's the point. Serial monogamy. That is true, actually. Um, so I, I, I don't think poly, uh, polyamory or non-monogamy uh, um, uh, should, should be looked as, uh, as a 
uh, as a substitute for monogamy. Uh, I think it should be just looked at as a form of how people look at relationships or how they find it uh, more uh, true to themselves or more um, more comfortable for them in practicing uh, a way or for a relationship they want to do. Um, I, I feel like all, all types of uh, relationships have their own challenges and benefits. Um, just yesterday I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and she was saying that she was um, um, uh, in a way dating two people at the same time however the thought of uh, having to share her partner with another person was absolutely a big no-no to her um, and so that made me think and and and, and um, uh, th th that is the case that um, uh, you choose the kind of relation the type of relationships you want based on the trade-offs that you make and, and 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 based on what you think that you would be gaining or make you happier in that type and and for some people and but um, uh, that. that's looking, interesting um, that's interesting because that she said okay. I'm okay <laughs> so she said I'm okay having two partners but if one of my partners has somebody else, I will not like it. Which may well be the way, you know, 80% or 90% of the human species may say, it sounds good in theory that, yeah, yeah, I have five partners. But then everyone else should be loyal only to me. That is that's not true. fair. And that's probably what my... That my, is very my, true. My, that is... That is very true. But however, a lot of people have, I think people have different levels of jealousy in them, as well as it is something that you can work on. Um, when children are growing up, um, they're not comfortable with sharing their toys with, uh, to their f with their friends or other siblings. However, uh, f uh, if you make them look at a greater good of doing that, uh, you can cultivate the uh, behavior of sharing things with them. Um, similarly, the uh, I think difference a difference between sharing a partner uh, and sharing a toy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, call me old-fashioned if you want, but there is a slight difference. <laughs> Um, see, a lot of the times, um, uh, sure. with regards to jealousy, uh, the problem that fe people feel is because um, uh, their partner don't, doesn't talk to them about it and has a separate relationship happening on the side that they're not aware of. And un like a lot of uncertainty because of not knowing about what is happening is what pe puts people in a position of uh, insecurity and jealousy. Okay. Um, I feel that a lot of the times when partners honestly talk about it, um, in fact, uh, a lot of times it g gets people to come together closer uh, and help them in understanding each other and what their likes are in there. Ah, so you, this is a way to get back into a stable <laughs> monogamous relationship, is that what you're saying? But you know, it, it's an interesting point. Dr. Rahita, mm -hmm. let me just come back to you. Let me just come back to you on a, on, a, on, a, on a broader psychological and, you know, societal reason. Why did monogamy actually come to being? And I think it was touched upon by a couple of people earlier. It does have a lot to do with child rearing and, and, and family because at the end of the day that's where it partly originates from one of the reasons for example that men get so upset about sexual you know uh, infidelity is because they want to make sure that the child who's they're bringing up is their own women want that emotional stability also to some extent this is what the, the theory which comes from the birds quite literally right this is where from bird hypothesis this is where if you're rearing a chick how do you make sure that it is your chick which is being read and how do you make sure that my partner is going to continue to feather the nest is at least one way in which in pop psychology it's being viewed as. Would you agree with that or do you think all of this is bogus which should not be discarded? So is childbearing a crucial element to all of this? I, I think, that's what think I'm trying so. To I think on. so. And having said that, I would definitely say that it's important to understand the difference between like we were touching upon <coughs> polyamorous and polygamous. <coughs> And then the difference be between whether it is consensual or non-consensual. Again, the debate rising to whether one person or multiple people can be loved with multiple person can at they? the same time. Can they? And still be you. and still so be. So psychologically, let me ask you: Is it possible? In terms of if we are saying if that can be substitute to the family microcosm and the structure of society, my answer is no, because at the end of it. I mean, we have young kids who seek relationship counseling, and when they are in multiple relationship, the idealized, romanticized relationship still, when they grow up, is being married or being in a long-term relationship, stable relationship with the Mr. Right or the Miss Right. As was being discussed, I think, uh, like they say, too much of familiarity, you know, it do it does bring boredom, and it can happen to any, uh, you know, any relationship. Uh, but the fact is that what ex exactly we are looking in the relationship, is it just in matters of physical terms or whether we are actually looking for happiness, contention. So, contentment. Now, uh, there is a lot of empirical data, you know, which actually shows that polyamorous is uh, quite a new concept, at least in India. But as far as po polygamy goes, <coughs> that, uh, you know, polygamy in terms is more so uh, socially detrimental in terms of that if you look at the empirical data, the kind of uh, violence, you know, whether it is domestic violence, whether it is uh, violence in terms of rape, robbery, and things like that, whether it is uh, in terms of upbringing of the children. In everything, 
monogamous and uh, polygamous stru family structures, they are very, very different. And polygamy has always been more socially detrimental. So, uh, okay. I think at the end of the day, it is, uh, you know, one partner, which if you want to have a happy and contented life, I think one has to Eventually stick to one partner. Ba Basil, let me see if you agree with that. Basil, as a, as a basic concept, I'm going to get into, I'm going to try and end with the, with, the, with the bringing up of children question, because that there is a certain issue. But Basit, hand in your heart, supposing you were to tomorrow come across one person and say, this is the person I would like to go, I mean, that idealized, romantic, monogamous notion. Here is a person I would like to spend my life with. Here is a person I would like to go old with. When I'm 80, I want to turn across and find her, you know, sleeping with her dentures on or off next to me. Is that something that you would eventually say, well, okay, maybe that's, that, that's ideal? Oh, that is not true personally for me at least. Um, um, I think people have different notions about what makes them happy. Like people have different, uh, uh, w w people's happiness lies in different things, right? Uh, for me, when I think of relationships, it's, uh, it always, almost always involves uh, different kinds of love from different kinds of people. Um, and and that, uh, that is quite essential for me that like uh, to realize that uh, I'm surrounded with people that I can uh, be on honest and true with. Uh, is more important for me than um, to realize that I'm in a marriage uh, uh, or, or in a union with someone who is probably staying there only because of uh, other uh, socially constructed um, uh, hurdles that have been created from uh, leaving from me. So it's quite important for me um, to realize that someone is sticking with me even though they had the option of leaving <coughs> um, because that uh, so, sort of like satisfies my need to know that. Actually, um, the option uh, of leaving is always now open now. Even if, you are in a, even if you're in a marriage, even if you're in a two-person marriage, I mean, like you're married to each other, you can leave. This is the 20th century. Nobody yes, stops you. It's not the, the Middle Ages where you can't say, okay, I'm getting a divorce and I'm going off with somebody. You can always leave. That always is an option. I'm still trying to figure out what the ideal uh -huh. according to you, uh, you know, would be. Um, Adetha, you want to weigh in on this at the right. end of the day? Because if it's just very specific to that. Right. Yeah, sorry, carry on. If it's just very specific to that, uh, I think it is wrong to make the assumption that I feel that, you know, in my head, my idealized uh, uh, image of a relationship is to, uh, to be with one person. With same intensity, I feel like a lot of people feel that uh, my ideal situation of happiness is to uh, share love with more than one person and not to feel bound myself with, uh, you know, um, uh, cutting out, a, uh, putting a line in where I uh, show affection or where I should receive affection from. Uh, I think um, for me and for many other people, uh, the preference lies over um, unbounded love, uh, over, you know, uh, having a long-term relationship with just one person and uh, dying together. Okay, so as I try and get final thoughts, from Adveta, so from what I can see based on our debate so far, pros and cons to this entire thing, mm -hmm. right? So obviously, especially when you're young as he is and you have the possibility, okay, I can be in a relationship with three people or two people or four people over the next six years, it sounds, it, there's, a, there's a certain attraction to that. Yes, it is possible that based on the human on your basic human nature you may well be attracted to more than one person in your lifetime so those are one side of the story other side of the story is the structure of the family which as he was mm -hmm. saying sometimes you know to bring up children a two-person relationship is safer and certainly for things like long-term compatibility we all want to be living really old when you're 17 80 and 90 it's obviously far easier to have that one person whom you're spending the last few years of your life in companionship with than the other way around sure but yes or no Kura, shura, wura, you know, those kind of scenarios, really. I think the, uh, the bottom line is, you know, marriage as an institution as well. And you have a lot of young people in your audience, I'm sure they'll attest to it, and a lot of young ladies who will say it's not that much of a primary institution anymore for women, you know, in the way that it has been in the past. And that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. It's just realistic, you know. It's not necessarily something that a lot of women especially aspire to anymore and that's that I think is great it's liberating because there are certain aspects to it which can be oppressive but moving away from that conversation and into this is really you know, what, what you hear a lot from polyamorous people is really they lay emphasis on emotional nurturing sustenance it's an emotional thing for them really more than it is maybe in monogamy non-monogamy which is more centered around the sexual aspect of it but I think with polyamorous people it's like an emotional thing and 
even when it comes to monogamy, you know, why would you want monogamy unless you had some kind of underlying emotional, psychological needs for it, which could be you may have abandonment issues or jealousy issues or things like that, which would make you feel secure and complete only in a monogamous <coughs> relationship. So I think we're, what we're moving towards, and this comes even when it comes to the sex sexuality spectrum, you know, when we look at it from all aspects, I think what we're moving towards is really identifying our own underlying needs as individuals and what structure, because they're all structures, even the polyamorous relationship, no matter how cool it looks on the outside, is still going to have some structure to it. Yeah. And it's because that's a human need to seek out structure. Fine, let me just turn back and get final thoughts from everybody else. So, quick last line from everyone, Nasir, your final view on this. We have the need for intimacy and the need for sex is a very powerful force which has been imbibed into our database. And I think that is what actually ultimately drives us to look for beyond of what we've got. All right, it's, it's all imbibed into your database. Gita, last quick words from you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We are I think that, uh, that uh, you know, as individuals, none of us is perfect. And uh, what in polyamorous, what I understand is that people are basically trying, when they are looking for perfection and they can't find it in one individual, they are looking for, you know, all the other traits, you know, in different individuals. But that, how long can, you know, one actually look for it and sustain it? So okay. ultimately it is uh, monogamy. Get used, you know, get, get, don't expect the world uh, from one person. Okay, last quick thoughts. I think the blur between being in a fulminating relationship and moving on to another one, vis-a-vis -vis being in multiple relationship at the same time is what's going to to always be the the point of debate what we really need to understand is that human brain is primed to seek a sensation and and this is a dopaminergic sensation like nasir said in the form of a sexual escapade in the form of a sexual overture which might be new which will always intrigue and fascinate human beings What's really very important is that the family microcosm and the system will stay, will be the useful part in which how the family will grow up. And that can't be the substitute for the polyamorous relationship that we are talking about. Okay, so the human brain may search for dopamine surges, but at the end of the day, you've got to look, think of the the unit that basically sustains society. Absolutely. I think when you're looking at the family as a unit, as a brick, if you will, or the foundation of a society, of a culture, of a nation, mm -hmm. and you can take this higher and higher up, it really is about being in relationships that are stable. And monogamy, monogamous relationships rather lend themselves to stability a lot better than, uh, than uh, you know, uh, polyamorous or polygamy or any other kind of definition of these relationships. So that's, that's important to note. On the other hand, also, I think uh, the statistics bear you out. So people take hope. This has all been about infidelity in some way, but really uh, less than 50% of people in marriages really venture outside of monogamy. Yeah. And that is a statistical fact, be it a progressive society or be it like a more conservative society. And that, that is true all around. It may vary according to gender. You know, more women in certain societies venture out of their marriage than they do in other marriages because like I said, marriage as an institution can be oppressive for women and often is. So that's really, uh, as far as the family unit is concerned, I think uh, monogamy is the best way to go forward and it gets a thumbs up on that, that it provides stability to okay. society. Fair enough. Murnalini, I, I know by almost by definition, a lot of the people who are coming to you are not happy with their individual yeah. break, but we've just heard from some of the others on the panel that at the end of the day, the, the, the brick for building society and building relationships would probably still be the monogamous relationship uh, as the most stable form, especially for you know, families and for relationships. What, what would be your take on that? Absolutely. I, I do believe. And, and let's see our parents, our in-laws, etc. Most of them have had a monogamous relationship. They, they had their issues, they had their tough tips. But it didn't really, you know, sort of uh, shatter the family structure which was there because there was a commitment to a marriage, a commitment to the institution of family which is there. And I think once you are committed to something, whether it's your profession, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your family, then I think we need to work around that. But at the same time, we must also accept one thing that we are humans at the end of the day and we are very, very likely to get into some relationships which are outside the marriage. Now, whether how, how are you able to deal with that relationship, whether it's a short term, whether it's only for the physical pleasure or is it also for an emotional pleasure. So monogamy, according to me, is not only straying in marriage for physical or sexual reasons, but it could also be for emotional anchorage. 
Now, if it is limited to that, then probably the institution of marriage can come back together. But if it is emotional plus sexual pleasures that you're looking at or some kind of variety that you're looking at, then obviously if it's a combination of two, then I think the institution of marriage or the family would definitely be wrecked in that sense of the word. All right, last word from you, Rahul Ishwar. Vikramji, in Indian culture, marriage is not a mere social contract, but there is a spiritual connect to it. And if we have any doubts about it, think about the word true love, close our eyes. I'm absolutely sure we can only have one person's face in our mind. Nobody will have four, pe four people's face in their mind when they think about true love. But the next thing is not very romantic. In order to find true love and sustain the true love, you need mentoring, premarital yeah, education point. and guidance. So we need, to, we need to find a balance with it and we need to sustain the whole idea of monogamous family for a better civilization. All right, Basit, last words from you because... Well, at least in this panel, we had a lot of detailed discussion on it, but I think you're still, you know, the, the, the needle is still to switch over where you convince everyone that this is, this is the, right, uh, the right way to go. So, a couple of points in particular, then I'll leave you the closing words. True, as Rahul said, true love, you eventually end up with one person rather than four people. I'm not sure if it's different with you. And B, as, a, as the unit for society, that marriage, a monogamous relationship, the two people, perhaps with their kids, is still the most stable brick to build society on, as has also come out. Your reaction to those two, and then I want to leave you to give your own final thoughts. The first one was with regards to um, uh, people having the idea, uh, when, when you think of one true love, right, uh, by definition, uh, okay, your, your true love that you imagine only of one person. And um, I, th I think um, it, it is different for some people, uh, especially for me, definitely, I can say for myself. Uh, but I'm sure that for Rahul, it's, uh, it's, it's probably for a, a single person. And it is true for a lot of people. Um, uh, with regards to um, uh, a family unit being more stabilized, um, you could, I, I believe that there could be arguments um, either ways. Um, um, in some polyamorous families where there are more than two uh, pa parents taking care of a child, um, you see that it's easily uh, more uh, uh, probable that the child has more care and support at all uh, times of his life of growing, as well as have different perspectives in the family than uh, being constrained to just to a, a, a single set of parents, right? Um, so that's um, that's a, uh, that's a benefit of, of uh, having a polyamorous uh, family. Uh, we have uh, already started moving away from the conventional notion that a family should be a, a male father and a female mother, and them raising together a child. However, we have uh, more and more increasingly seeing that there are single parents as well, uh, children growing up in joint families and nuclear families, and you could make cases for about like pros and cons for each types of uh, um, growing uh, growing child, right? Um, uh, coming back to um, uh, the final thoughts that I have uh, on the topic, I think the crux of my argument stems from the fact that um, uh, it's, it's about personal liberty, uh, about uh, about letting people um, uh, do what they uh, what makes them happier. Uh, I think there is a lot of tyranny going around in the sense of trying to impose uh, what you feel uh, uh, your values in morality or your preferences over uh, the whole of the society. Um, um, and in that sense, it is some, and somehow um, imposed by the society by means of uh, correction as well okay. as by means of ingraining it in, 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 in all aspects of culture. For example, um, uh, uh, another common example that you could think of is um, uh, young girls having the notion that there's a Prince Charming that'll come and take uh, uh, her away uh, from all her troubles and have a, have a happy married life. Uh, that's a, kind, uh, that's a uh, okay. wrong notion. So don't, don't believe in... Of, uh, or marriage. <laughs> all right. So, uh -huh. so don't believe necessarily in fairy tales. Uh, uh, and by the way, that's... Coming to what I was... Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. But okay, I get the, get the, the, the thrust of what you're saying. Don't expect... Uh, you know, don't don't wait for for Prince Charming. Don't expect fairy tales. And by the way, that might, to some extent, link up as we end this show with what Rahul was saying. Also, have realistic expectations of of, of relationships exactly. or marriages, uh, you know, themselves, and have some sort of a sense of what you should expect and what you should not expect. Look, I'm not sure that we're going to reach a definitive discussion on a subject like this. It's an interesting point to debate and discuss, and maybe we'll come up with some new concepts. We'll try and find a new word to come in and discuss every three or four months and just see what we actually make of it. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, this was The Big Fight. We'll be back next week with another episode. Bye for now.